earlier today we heard a bit of kind of um, uh, practical things in deep learning and applying deep learning. Mustafa talked about a lot of a lot of different things, things you can do in models to make them train better or generalize better, right? Uh, things like batch normalization, dropout, different kinds of weight regularization techniques, um, issues related to overfitting and underfitting, right? Um, uh, Joel was talking a lot about a lot of interesting stuff. So I, I think maybe, you know, if you haven't already, um, you can try to implement some of these ideas with the examples here. So in particular, I would strongly recommend at this point, I think it's very appropriate if you didn't already to look at this overfitting and underfitting notebook. So how many people already tried that one? Half, less than half, hard to say, but a fair number. Um, yeah, so I do, I do encourage you to try and look at look into this and uh, it's going to have you train some models. First you train like a small one, a medium one and a big one on the same data to sort of all in one go. And then it compares the results, okay? And then it introduces some regularization techniques and then you kind of look at the results again, okay? So um, I think what, yeah, what you should try if you haven't run this is, is go through it and understand it and kind of, Try to you know see how you can add in things like dropout, how to add in um, weight decay or um, L2 regularization to your neural networks. Um, take a look kind of the the final results and, and see what you think because I'm going to ask you about it I think a little bit later. Um, and then yeah, I, I want you to kind of think about these questions. You know, sort of like you've seen this a bunch of times. You've seen these kind of plots. Um, just make sure that it's sunk in. Like how do you know? whether you're underfitting, how do you know whether you're overfitting? What are the real diagnostics? And then what do you do? So if it's overfitting, what do you think, let's say based on that example, what seems to be the most promising thing to try, okay? Um, let's say, well, so <laughs> this is a little bit of a trick question. What is the most ideal way to improve it? So think about that and then think about kind of things you can do if you don't have the ideal situation. Um, Underfitting, there's not too much here on underfitting. Um, people don't talk about it quite as much, but um, it's worth thinking about. And then this this case here, um, yeah, actually if you look at this, all of these are actually overfitting in the sense that, you know, the training and validation always diverge. Um, so I'm curious to see, you know, try to see if you can actually build a model that just does not overfit at all on this case. I, I, I didn't try it myself, so I don't even know how hard that is. Um, but I think this is very worthwhile to go through. So um, do that. And then one other thing that I added, um, did everybody go through the convolutional neural networks one? How many people did the convolutional neural networks one? Yeah. Um, so one thing you could do with that, actually you could even think about doing things with the basic classification, but here we already have a CNN, so it's a good place to start. Um, the data set is of course very small, but you can do things like now try to add data augmentation. So there's this um, documentation here, some examples of this image data generator thing in Keras. So this will also work in, in the TensorFlow Keras. Notice here I'm on that Keras IO page. Um, but um, like you were told before, you know, everything that's here on Keras IO, this is just a API spec. So you can also use just TF Keras for all of this. So um, this thing in particular is very convenient for applying a lot of different kinds of transformations you might care about on image data sets to augment the training data, um, to help you kind of learn, to help your model um, um, learn things more easily, learn more uh, of symmetries or things that, that shouldn't affect um, mapping of input to output. So translations in the images, um, some like changing of, uh, of various image kinds of things. If you're an image expert, you probably understand, but like ZCA, Epsilon, some um, normalization, some flipping, uh, rescaling, or even, I think, I'm pretty sure I saw rotation in here. There's, yeah, there's some, 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 some kind of rotation thing you can do. Um, and you don't have to change too much if you do this. So this example actually uses the CIFAR 10 data set. Um, this, probably, this might work a little better on CIFAR 10. So one thing you could do actually, if you want, is just sort of copy the notebook, make a new notebook, and just instead of doing the MNIST problem, you could use CIFAR 10. It's very easy, so you just have this, you just import the CIFAR 10 thing. So this doesn't actually show where you import CIFAR 10. It must be, 
in some other example, but you could Google how do you get SciFAR 10. It's just like from Kara's data sets, I think, import SciFAR 10. Um, of course, it should be from TensorFlow. Actually, it might not even matter where you import that one from, from which Keras, but um, this is a NumPy data set. Um, the, the MNIST one we had was a NumPy data set. So basically, you just have a way to kind of wrap it in this image data generator. And um, one thing to note is that instead of calling model fit, we call model fit generator if you do this. So um, fit generator just means we're gonna pass it um, some kind of Python generator or generator-like object. So it's something that's just going to produce batches of data. Um, so if you wanted to do pure Keras and, and you, you know, had your data set in many different files that you need to be able to open and close things, you would have to do it with some kind of generator. Um, but in this case, we just use it to, to kind of generate um, using this existing NumPy array, which is fitting in memory. So you can just say flow on the data set and it will generate batches and you can pass that to fit generator. Uh, so that should be pretty easy for you to try. Um, if you tried on the MNIST thing, you know, you, you may or may not see any kind of improvement in terms of the, the model. Uh, MNIST is pretty simple, but um, um, if you do see some improvements and they're good, then uh, I guess I'd be curious to know. So that's something you can try. I encourage you to do it. Um, you could try things like adding batch normalization. So you may have seen snippets of code of batch normalization in Keras so far. I'm not sure. It probably would have flown by in a slide or something. But uh, it's very easy to find documentation. It's really just a layer. Again, if you manage to add in another convolutional layer to your model, it's pretty straightforward to instead add in a batch normalization layer. Okay. So see if you can do that. See if you see any, uh, any difference. Again, you may not on MNIST. But when you think about applying this to your own scientific data sets, uh, batch normalization may turn out to be important. OK. So um, yeah, that, that's really it in terms of what I would guide you to do. Um, Again, the, the advanced examples are still here. If you haven't worked through some of those, you can go ahead and do that. The code can be a little more complicated. It's using, you know, I think pretty much all of these are using that other kind of API for building models with Keras, where you subclass a model. Uh, Josh showed some, some, some stuff on that um, in his talk, uh, and using this like gradient tape thing to track the, the gradients. So um, hopefully you'll recognize that a little bit when you look at these, but, um, as before, uh, if you have questions, if you have issues, uh, raise your hand. We'll try to come to you and help you, or ask on Slack. Um, we only, we're only going to be here doing this for a little bit, though. Um, only another 30 minutes, and then we have a talk. So um, do what you can, and um, you can still do stuff on Thursday in the self-guided hands-on. That will be part of the working lunch. Yeah, and you can, you can kind of do things in between too. We're, we don't want like the GPU usage to really explode outside of the hands-on times, but it hasn't been a problem yet. Okay, any questions? Okay, have fun. And some folks were having issues logging onto Jupyter, getting these 500 errors and um, our Jupyter expert, Rollin, is, is able to see some of that activity and he can kind of clear out the, the, the issue with certain accounts. Um, if you had an issue earlier, try again. It might be fixed now. If you see it now, let us know. Uh, so, since there's like 15 minutes before the next talk, I just <laughs> was kind of curious if anybody kind of noticed this thing. So um, this overfit and underfit notebook certainly shows um, a bit of interesting stuff. It shows how you can implement these things. But did anybody have any kind of uh, thoughts on the final, the final uh, result? Any? Yeah, I, I think I think you get it. Um, <laughs> it, it. I guess it's just not a great example. But if you look at this plot, um, so there's the blue lines and then there's the yellow lines, right? And actually, they don't have the baseline on here, but it, this one is baseline with L2. Um, this one is actually quite relevant. So, no, actually, it's the same issue. Um, does it look like the yellow does better than the blue? So the dotted line is the validation, and the solid line is the training. What do people think? Is the yellow better than the blue? Is the blue better than the yellow? Yellow seems better, huh? 
I mean, certainly it's, uh, there's less of a generalization gap over here, right? But um, is this where we would take our model from? Would you use like the, the model from epoch 18? <laughs> no, no? <laughs> which, which epoch would you use in this case? Over here, so is it better? <laughs> It's like, uh, it's probably just noise. <laughs> They're basically equivalent. So, I mean, it indicates that kind of you're improving the, the gap a little bit, but yeah, in this case, it's just a bad example. It doesn't seem to actually be any better. Um, and here was the same. Because I mean, this is your best result right here. <laughs> so I think it's just like the, a little bit too much of an academic example. But interesting things to watch out for. Some would say yes. I mean, some would say, um, that if you're really trying to push for best possible perform performance, you first want to have a very highly parameterized model, very deep and complex, and you want to be in the overfitting regime, and then you want to try and push that curve down. Um, I think there are people who would contest that philosophy, who would say it's better to start simple, where you kind of understand models and then progressively get more complex. I'm a little more in that camp, but it does, I think, depend on the final outcome. Maybe if you're really, really, really want to get state of the art, then, then this is what makes sense. But if you're just starting to do research, maybe it makes more sense to start simple. So there's something now you can do because there is, it's actually pretty easy to put early stopping into these models. There's just another Keras callback for that. So you can look up how to do um, Keras early stopping. Uh, plenty of links. Most of them are blog posts, it seems. <laughs> And this is TF 1.14, but that should be the same. Um, so there should be an example. So you can create um, an early stopping callback. You can set some things like the patients, like how many epochs it should wait before, before stopping, um, and so on. Yeah, it's useful to look actually at all the callbacks that are here to see what kinds of things you can do. Um, well, there's not, there's not a huge number of things that maybe you haven't played with yet or thought about yet. So there's checkpointing. Um, that was shown in one of the examples. Uh, stuff for doing things with the learning rate. So Mustafa talked a little bit about sometimes it's useful to decay the learning rate at various stages of the training. So one of these things like um, learning rate scheduler lets you do that. Or reduce LR on plateaus. So this would check like, has the training kind of stagnated? Okay, let's decay the learning rate, right? Go for longer. Uh, so that's all I had for you. So I think probably we'll have the next